I've been playing a bit more with this, the Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, and today specifically, or this week specifically, I've been playing with these, which are the time of flight sensors, the ST1s, the slightly complicated and frustrated one. And it's the VL53LOX. So it's an optical laser based distancing sensor. Uh, and I've got a pair of them working with a Raspberry Pi Pico. So first, a bit of a shout out. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that uh, Kevin McAleer, uh, I, I saw his video on YouTube uh, on the VL53 LOX on the Raspberry Pi Pico, uh, and it was definitely helpful in getting this up and running. Um, among other things, he has a Git repo, which I will link to, uh, with the Raspberry Pi Pico VL53 LOX code in it. Um, I have also created a fork of that repo with some of my own enhancements for fixes, and I'll PR some of them back if uh, if he wants them. So I'll, I'll create a PR for some of them. Uh, among them, a couple of small memory fixes, uh, and we'll get into this later. The ability to uh, uh, set the uh, I2C address, which is useful if you want to get two of these on one bus. Handy. Um, only saves you one pin at the moment, but you know you might want to get lots of things on that bus. Um, and also a couple of things around error checking and being a bit more uh, error, error tolerant. But uh, otherwise, actually, it's a great resource there. Uh, go and check him out. Uh, I'll put links to uh, Kevin McAleer and uh, his cool robot site, which was, uh, what was it called? Smarsfan.com. There you go. Smarsfan.com. Uh, basically, he builds small robots and robot fans like me. Well, you know, he's obviously a great resource. OK, so let's get into it. If you are doing any wiring on Raspberry Pi Pico, uh, please do use the Pico data sheet. Page five has got this rather excellent diagram uh, with all the pins on it. And I'll admit I rely on that diagram a lot. It's the kind of thing you want to print out and stick up in your workshop somewhere just while you're working. Big as you can get it, just so you can go, OK, I've got all those pins down. The only thing I've really memorized is kind of where some of the power pins are and, you know, the, the, the nice grounds are. I love, I love the way, by the way, design wise, I love the way you've got a ground every few pins. That's really helpful. Thank you, Raspberry Pi. OK, the code. So the first thing is, is there is the code for the underlying talking to the VLOX. Um, I will say this code, it's not particularly pretty. It's uh, a little bit difficult to understand. Um, and uh, I think uh, Kevin McAleer will agree. It's one of those things that um, ST only released a reference library. They didn't really release a registered description. Uh, and so this has been converted by a number of people, even people before Kevin's work on it, uh, to MicroPython from the Arduino libraries. Um, and there's a few changes again to save on memory, like making things const, which I've gone through and done more of those. Um, it this code works. It's not very pretty because the device interacting with the device isn't very pretty. And you find things like uh, big blocks of config. Oh, that's a small block, but big blocks of config like this, which are basically they aren't explained in the SD data sheet. So despite this device being a great device in some ways, it's got some frustrating things around documentation. Um, this code, uh, again, there'll be linked below, but uh, my current fork is down here. In, so if you see my Git remote, it is on github.com. It is Orion Robot VL53 LOX. Um, and I like to use Git with SSH so I can push and pull really easily. Um, so what I've also done with this is I've stuck a little uh, convenience function here, and it may become inappropriate later to just set up the device, which is some of the code that uh, Kevin has in the uh, TOF test, time of flight test file he has, um, where it sets up a device with an I2C bridge. It creates this measurement timing budget. Um, so I guess, it, well, it says here, the longer the budget, the more accurate the reading. So I guess that's more what, how, how much longer it's waiting or how many times it's trying to get a reading to average them out, I guess. Um, and there are these other two settings, uh, so the vertical cavity, cavity surface emitting laser. Um, again, 
I don't think I'm going to go into too much detail about what these two ranges are. Um, only just to say that, yes, you can pass values in here. Um, there are sensible defaults in the uh, original code. OK, so convenience function, partially because I'm creating two of these devices and we'll get to that. Um, so TOF test is just a test script to drive this thing. Again, this is code that Kevin originally wrote. Um, I've actually kind of named two buses on two different sets of pins. You can use different IO pins. Just remember to refer back to that uh, wiring diagram because it shows what pins are connected to which bus. And you can't reverse by pins the STSL and they are kind of they're fixed, although there are many groups of pins on each bus. Um, and I've just got a print function in there just to kind of help with any debug because things went wrong. Uh, one of the first things that went wrong was I didn't know about this X shut pin. If you do not pull that high, the device might partially initialize. It might kind of mess around a bit. If you pull it low, it's definitely shut down. If you pull it high, it's definitely up. If it's floating, expect random weird stuff to happen. So always pull that pin either high or low if you want the device on or off. It's designed so you can go and put it into low power mode or maybe do some other interesting bus shenanigans, which we'll get to. Um, but uh, just, just keep an eye on what you're doing with that pin. Do not let that pin float. Otherwise, it will ruin your work. It'll make it, you'll have a bad day. And I was scratching my head for um, about, I don't know, day and a half trying to figure out what I was doing wrong and whether there was something wrong and whether I maybe this code needed debugging. Maybe I needed to go and look at the, uh, the underlying, underlying Arduino code. No, it was purely about that pin. So word of warning on that. Um, setting up the I2C bus. Uh, printing a scan of the bus. Now, I went a bit further, and actually this 41 is decimal, but since everything else refers to the address in hex, let's go with OX29. So that's the hexadecimal address for this device. And this is just me checking, did I even register one of these devices? Now, in this particular test, that's fine. Um, so this is not using my helper. It's creating the object, measures this timing budget, outputs it. Again, this is Kevin's code, really. Um, it goes and sets these two periods and it puts it in. There's minus 50. There's a kind of a calibration fiddle factor that Kevin's put in of minus 50. Um, maybe there's a good way to calibrate that out for real. Uh, but with the board as I just showed it on the, uh, the other camera, uh, we should be able to get this to run. So let's have a go. Now, before I run it, there's one other thing. You'll notice I am in PyCharm. I am not in Thony. Now, Thony is really cool, but because I was kind of getting a bit complicated between different uh, files here and maybe diffing things, I wanted my, uh, you know, all singing, all dancing, full fat editor, which is where PyCharm's at. So to get it so I can run it quite easily, I've used R shell. So R shell is a, well, sounds like a remote shell. There is a remote shell for things that are MicroPython based. Um, so if I do a pip freeze, I'm in a virtual environment. Um, you can install it in whichever Python you're using. So you probably want some local Python interpreter. Um, it's got this R shell, 0.0.3, or 30 even. Um, this allows you to interact with a MicroPython board. And uh, because I had a bunch of different commands to get this set up, I did a little bit of automation. Um, uh, and that was because sometimes while tweaking both the VL53LOX file and the various test drivers, I would be toing and froing. So this is automation. Uh, it just takes a file here. Um, I want to get PyCharm to pass that file name in, but it doesn't quite work with this terminal volume. We'll come back to that. Um, does a bit of printing. Copies all the Python files. This is inside our shell across to slash PyBoard, which is the MicroPython board. Um, these two commands, which I've commented out, were supposed to reset the board. Um, kind of do a soft reset, but if you do a Control D at the end of the last run, it'll do it anyway. And in this one, where it starts the the REPL, the reval print loop, on the Pi board, on the MicroPython board, on the Raspberry Pi Pico in this case, um, this then imports the file we wanted to run without its extension. Bit of bash, you know, bash hacking to take off the extension. 
gives us the file we, gives us running it by importing it which is kind of the micro python way so that just means i can just run and spin and run and spin nice and easy okay so i want to run and we'll comment that out and comment this in so tof test.py which is this bit up here and i'll tell you what let's go and start the other camera too shall we so this tiny little thing is the VL53LOX and uh, it's got a number of pins so I can just kind of quickly go through what they are. So you've got VCC and GND which is your voltage and ground. You've got SCL and SCA, SDA so these are your I2C clock and data lines. You've got the GPIO1 which I've not really used and X shut which is actually a shutdown pin which will shut down when you hold it low. Um, as Kevin says in his video, these come in a number of form factors. I've gone for this particular form factor at the moment um, because for what I needed, I needed to make sure this X shut pin, the shutdown pin, is broken out. Um, this is worth noting that on some of these boards, uh, this one is only a sort of, well, it's got a double-sided load, but it doesn't appear to be pulling up the X shut pin. Um, it may actually have, I suspect there's a, 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 some kind of low dropout regulator on that board just so you can drive it from 5 and 3 volts. Um, so an important note when wiring, unless you're going to do something fancy with this pin, in which case you wire it to a GPIO, you need to wire this to a high pin, that is a voltage pin. Um, maybe you should pull it up through a resistor, um, pull up you know, pull up 1K resistor. If not, then just wire it to a high pin. Okay, so wiring. Uh, so I've got a breadboard here that I've been fancying about with. Uh, let's just clear it down enough to get to one of these devices. So what have we got? Okay, so we've got the Raspberry Pi Pico, and we have a, uh, a ground here and a positive line here, which is the three volt bus. Um, ignore those two wires because that was when I had two of these. But these wires up here are just connecting the voltage and the negative across this other rail here. So I've got it on two both sets of rails so under here and this is where it gets a little bit tricky because there isn't an awful lot of space um, I've got the power and ground going to the power and ground here and I've got the SCL and SDA wired across to these two pins um, we can take a look at the data sheet uh, and uh, for the Raspberry Pi Pico um, but uh, you can take it from, from me right now that those two are uh, the GPIO uh, 14 and 15, which are both on the I2C1 bus. Now, the X hut left like this is floating. Uh, unless there is a pull up on the board, you will need to take a wire and stick that into the positive. If you put it into the negative, it shuts down the device. If you put it in the positive, it brings the device up so we can use it. Okay, uh, so that's wired in, and I guess we can go over to some code. On the board, when I wave the pencil over, we should be able to see data coming through in the output here. I will start a run. I've got it actually tied to a run configuration in, uh, in PyCharm here. So if I hit the play button, we should see it. It's uploaded all those files. You can see it uploading them now. That takes a while, connects and starts the run. And it's probably detecting the camera because it's saying, well, well a few hundred millimeters. But if I wave the pen, you can see it. And that minus 50 is a bit iffy because you're seeing some negative numbers there. So not quite the calibration. You know, it's, it's probably good enough for a robot to avoid walls. It doesn't, for a robot to be avoiding walls, we don't need it to be millimeter accuracy. We just need to know which one is closer to a wall or too close to a wall. Let's avoid it. But uh, you can see that is clearly working. Uh, and if I want it to die, and we'll do this just for fun, if I unplug the X hut, bosh, Osera 5. And when you see Osera 5 on an I2C thing, that basically is I couldn't communicate, it's done, I'm gone, boff. And the X hut, if it's floating or if it's down, you will see that Osera. Okay. Let's uh, put this back. It's not going to magically start, I'm afraid, because we have killed it by doing that. Um, again, when using our shell, you need to use... Uh, so to exit this, you need to use Control and X. And that exits the R shell. Okay, that exits, exits the REPL inside the R shell. 
and uh, if you look back at our run me you see where i've run the REPL, this tilde says commands follow here and then here's the commands i'm going to get to run which is just our import um there's some horrible bash escaping going on here if you follow your command with a tilde it tells the the REPL, the reval print loop to exit but actually in this case because i want to debug it i don't want to exit plus there appears to be a quirk which is that if you tell it to exit, then it won't display whatever the uh, traceback is here. So if you're trying to debug it, it you don't want it to do that because if it eats your traceback, you can't even see what went wrong. I mean, most times out of 10, unfortunately, with this, it's going to be OS error 5, but, you know. OK, so that's connecting 1. And 1 is OK. I mean, 1 is kind of fun. But... When you're going to do robots, one of the cool things to be able to do is to have kind of some differential sensing so I know whether there's something to the left of me or to the right of me. Or maybe I want to go as far as having three, you know, left, right and front sensor. Um, great if you're doing maze robots or so on. Um, so I'm going to insert another device. And the first thing I'm going to do actually is unplug the Pico. And uh, let's go plug in and wire the other one. Right, I've already got some pins set up here and that's because I've been here with this wired up before. So we'll leave ourselves a little bit of working room. We'll put these a bit closer together. Just make sure we've lined up those ground pins. I don't want to overlap the other one. Don't want to be sensing each other. That would be silly. Um, okay, there we go. And on a robot, I'd probably use these bolt holes to bolt it somewhere. Okay, right. I've got a couple of spare wires. So first thing I'm going to do is let's see what happens when we wire it to a different USB bus. USB bus? I2C bus. Okay, uh, referencing the Raspberry Pi Pico documentation, um, we want STL is the, this pin here on this bus, and SDA is this pin here. So these are on separate buses because at this point they're going to be coming up at the same time with the same address, so we have to put them on different buses at the moment and the all important X shut pin. Okay, cool. So now we have two of these time of flight sensors connected to different buses. And I'll plug that back in. Okay, back over to the code. And uh, I actually created a test, was it um, multi-bus? Okay, um, I'm going to get rid of this line because it's a bit cheeky because that was a test I just ran the first time I started messing with this. Um, so this is when I'm using this setup device uh, helper that I talked about earlier. So instead of going through uh, all of this code from this line up to, say, this line, um, I've gone, well, I could just go and stick that in a function which is what we ended up with down here. That's the same code, basically. And I can now just call it twice. And I've created one of each bus. So there's a the bus zero, bus one with their pins. Awesome source, there we go. Oh, one more thing before we run it. We'll need to change our file to run. Um, I haven't quite managed to see if I can get PyCharm to hook this up again. The uh, extension that allows me to run it this way doesn't quite have that. I mean, I could just type it at the terminal, I suppose, if I was being less lazy. But there we go. OK, so two time of flight multi bus is the demo we're going to run. Let's just close this terminal window and launch a fresh one. So again, it's uploading all the new code. Um, I haven't really changed the code, but when I was you know, iterating, having a single play button to upload and run it was great. OK, so we've got two sensors. And if I put the pen over one, you can see one of them's catching the pen, one's not. And if I switch, I can get switch between the two and flip between two sensors with independent readings. There we go. I suppose I've put them two so close together, it's a bit tricky, but you can see me moving the pen and you can see the senses changing. So there we go. We've got two devices, one on each bus. This is great. It's using four pins on the, um, on the uh, Pico. But the thing is, you might want to be able to put two devices on the same bus or you might also need to put a device on a bus where there's something else sharing the same I2C. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was fiddling around with the Raspberry Pi Pico and this camera 
um the was it the mp uh the mini 2 mp plus camera which is a uh, i2c and spi device and i think that uses the same i2c address as our friend here the vlox sensor so hmm not great uh we'll need to change it okay let's stop our code i'm going to do a unceremonious control c let's kill it don't forget to control x if you do not exit the uh the ripple here expect some weird behavior next so do that control x otherwise your next run it'll sit there and not connect in fact i'll tell you what let's just let's just see what happens if we do this so if i run this just wait for it takes a while to copy be nice if i could do some kind of rsync so it knew what it already copied right if i control c that but i don't exit that shell and hit play again it creates a new terminal failed to connect and that failed to connect is because there's something sitting there basically already hogging that bus as it were um so if i now go and exit the old one there we go and i'll control d to get rid of it and we'll exit this one that one's just in the shell it won't work yet i have to control c but i guess if i run it again and here i am using the terminal once it's exited it'll copy it'll work again so just make sure you use control x to exit those REPL shells before you try something else. Control C to kill it, Control X to exit. Cool. Okay, so let's go rewire this for a single bus with two devices. Okay, for two devices, um, we're going to get rid of nearly all of this wiring here and change it. Um, the first change we're going to make is this SCL needs to be wired to that SCL which is where this green wire has gone and this SDA needs to be rewired to the other SDA okay they're on the same bus happy days well not quite because they also now have the same address so on the same bus with the same address they're both going to try and respond this is not going to work so we also need this X shut pin we're going to wire it to GPIO 16. So then we can use this pin. We can drive this one low to turn this one off so we can talk to one at a time. But we're going to do something sneakier. We're also going to set the address. So we're going to set the address of this device while this one's shut down and then bring this device, the other device, up afterwards. Let's see the code. So we've got TOF, two TOF, single bus. So one of the additions I made to uh, Kevin's code, set address. It's go, there's an ITC slave device address on the device. We're going to set this to the new address. I'm going to make sure the new address is known about in the class. In this code, we've still got pretty much the same code as the multibase, except we've now set up this pin 16 as an output pin, which I've called the device one X shut down, X shut. Um, to set up device zero, like I said before, we turn off the other device, we shut it down, set up the first device on IGC bus one. So these are both on bus one now. Uh, set its address to something else. I've gone for OX31, I've gone for another odd address. Um, there's some trickiness around IGC and addresses, but uh, an odd address does well here. Um, got some print statements just because this broke. When I was working on this, broke until I kind of got this to work. Um, it broke because, again, I tried to set an address that wasn't going to work, it wasn't going to communicate, so I was getting that lovely boss error 5 when trying to communicate with the uh, second device. So, once it's set this first device to a different address, it can now boot the second address, second device. <clears throat> and on the second device, we've got a sleep for, and tboot is a boot up time, it's actually defined in the data sheet, tboot is 1.2 milliseconds max. Okay, I've set tboot to 1,200 microseconds. There we go. That gives us 1.2 milliseconds. It's worth waiting because if you start trying to communicate with a device after bringing it out shut down and it's not quite ready, then you're probably going to end off Sarah 5. Or maybe sometimes you will and sometimes you won't, which is even worse in a way. Uh, so we set up the second device. Now notice this line and this line are identical. It's the same bus, got all the same settings. The reason we're setting up the same device with the same settings is now the first device is on a different address. So it's fine. We've set up two devices. The sequence is 
first device, change its address, bring up the second device, and it'll be on the default address. We could change its address too. Um, and then there is a finally at the bottom here. So the while true, by the way, is just like the one we had in the single device. Um, I had a bit of an issue at one point where one was coming up, the other one was measuring strange results. And uh, I haven't really gotten to why it did that, but a reboot and it went away. <sighs> Sigh. Um, we will find out at some point. I'll find out what that means. Um, but uh, there's a try finally around here to make sure that when I exit this, we get the default address of the first device. Now, if you forget this, you'll probably need to go and muck around with the X shut uh, line on the first device to reset it so we can get the address, which is why we have this handy loop here that I can just pull to go and change and reset the first device because I added this a bit later. But reset it to the default address, otherwise next time you run, it's going to fail here because it, it's not trying to communicate on the new address because we're trying to set the address at runtime. OK, uh, so this is the two to time of flight single bus demo. So we'll just comment that out, comment that in, and we should be able to get this running and do the same demo with a pencil. Oh, unable to find board. Do you know why that is? Because I've not plugged it in. <laughs> right, let's try that again. Uh, let's close those and run. Okay, so it's connecting. It's uploading my code again. I know it's not changed, but that's fine. And we'll wait for it. There we go. Setting up the devices. So we've got both devices again. And there we go. We can do one. We can do the other with the pencil demo again. So what this means now, oh, there we go. Look, we're getting 8192 here. So there we're getting a strange value. Maybe it was too close from one of these devices. And that might be because it's actually catching on something. I don't know why it does that sometimes. Um, we now have two devices on the same bus on different addresses. It means we could also arguably put on the same bus as this, although memory constraints and speed constraints on the Raspberry Pi Pico say you probably don't want to put a camera on the same bus. That might be the time when you use a second Pico. Um, they're cheap. Why not use two, three, four, many? Uh, but uh, yeah, we now have two time of flight sensors on the same bus on the Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, if you have, please give me a like and subscribe even. And uh, I hope you have a good week. Go make stuff and be awesome.